everybody. Um, welcome back to Who's Afraid of the Humanities. I think after hiatus is around two months. Um, and uh, so we have today with us um, uh, Dr. Tosa Goshal. Um, she's an assistant professor at um, California State University. She's a humanities researcher and a writer. And we're so proud to have uh, her today uh, to resume uh, the episodes of our podcast. Hi, Dr. Goshal. Uh, I welcome you very, very warmly uh, to today's um, episode. How are you? Thank you, Vinny. Thank you for doing this podcast. Uh, I'm well. Uh, right now, we were in the summer break and we are about to resume the fall semester mm -hmm. um, in a week. Um, mm -hmm. Here, we still have online classes for the next semester. Mm -hmm. So uh, just preparing for that. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, right. How are you? I'm fine. Um, it, it's been a hectic couple of months and weeks in here too. Um, and COVID is, you know, wreaking havoc here uh, in Sri Lanka. So I think it's kind of like um, a very, very unpredictable as to what is going to happen uh, in the next moment. Yeah, so, so everything is, you know, uh, in chaos, <laughs> if that's the word to use. Yeah. So, um, uh, when you reached, uh, when 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 your work, I mean, I, I mean, I heard of your work. I thought it would be very interesting to talk to you um, about the research that you do and your your commitment to the humanities. Um, so we, let's first talk about um, your decision to select um, or to be a humanities student at the beginning. What what motivated you to be or choose humanities, be a humanities researcher as you are right now? I think um, what happened was, you know, in school, so I was in South Asia, in India, when I was uh, a school student. And, mm -hmm. you know, in the curriculum, the way the curriculum is shaped in India is that you had to make a decision about whether you would study arts or science or yeah. Um, I think the third is called commerce uh, mm. at the school level. Mm. And I chose science uh, at the time because I really enjoyed physics and mm -hmm. um, I was really interested in um, sort of uh, computer science as well, uh, mm -hmm. problem solving, that kind of thing. But at the same time, I was also very interested in stories. Um, okay. How stories are told, what stories do to people's minds, uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was also uh, this kind of part-time student journalist uh, right. at the time. So uh, I was interested in uh, various subcultures in Calcutta where I was based and I would go out there and report, you know, mm -hmm. this is how uh, this community lives out here, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. um, it was only toward the end of my, uh, you know, school education that I really felt that even in the sciences, what I was really interested in was um, you know, the philosophies or ideas at a mm. deeper level. Okay. Uh, at that time, I guess I did not have the language for it, so I wouldn't use the word philosophy for it. Uh, I would be like, okay, I'm interested in physics at a conceptual level, but mm. it's not as if I want to do physics, if that makes <laughs> sense, um, or computer science, you know, the same kind of thing. And, you know, I was writing and so I thought, uh, okay, so what I'm really interested in maybe is stories and storytelling mm -hmm. and, um, and that sort of thing. So that's how I uh, kind of uh, got into humanities. I got mm -hmm. into English literature and um, at the bachelor's level, I studied English and uh, had Bengali literature mm -hmm. as one of my electives and film studies. So all of that kind of confirmed for me the hunch I had that what I'm interested in is observing things, learning about things, but also learning about the philosophies behind them, what they do in our culture, how they work and so on. So, you know, stories connected to the sciences or stories connected to um, any kind of, uh, you know, other discipline we think about. So, that's how uh, I kind of understood my own uh, interests and inclinations. And I continued uh, studying mm -hmm. along those lines. So masters and then PhD. Um, 
I did not know at the time that you could, for instance, combine your interest in the sciences and the humanities mm -hmm. uh, in the way that I learned when I came for grad school uh, in the US. Um, and th that is reflected in my book, really, because mm -hmm. my book mm -hmm. tries to work with um, narratives and cognitive science and philosophy of mind with mm -hmm. uh, literature. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of my trajectory. Yeah. The humanities. Let's let since you mentioned mentioned the book, I think we will we will um, in, in in later like uh, uh, with time we can discuss about your book, um, uh, you know, in detail. Um, so your transition from sciences to humanities, um, you know, with what we are exp experiencing in different parts of the world, the, the crisis in the humanities, the funding, and all that. When, when you look back at your decision, what do you think about, about you know, um, now being an assistant professor and the, the social and economic security that you experience and the kind of, um, you know, the, the economic and social rewards that you could have had if you had followed, uh, you know, physics or, or, or a STEM subject. So what do you think about that? Like, like we, are, we are at a very volatile kind of situation right now. I agree with the assessment that we are in a volatile situation in the humanities and, you know, every time there is talks of a budget crisis, it seems as if humanities is the one that um, may get kind of a, a reduced budget line and yeah. so on. So that's true. But I think um, what, as I said, even in the sciences, what I used to be interested in was this philosophy, the theoretical sides of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I have friends who pursued sort of, you know, doctoral degrees in theoretical aspects of a particular sciences. And uh, if they have stayed in the, I, I don't know, if PR is the right word, like if they have stayed in like that theoretical lane completely, mm -hmm. um, they face a lot of constraints and budgetary right. restrictions in their right. own way. Right. Uh, there's pressure on them to bring funding to the universities as right. well. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I think um, the, it, unless a one is pursuing a subject that fits whatever the current narrative is around mm -hmm. us about mm -hmm. You know, this is very useful to us because of X. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of pressure and constraints on academics just in general. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there is a difference, and you know, you just have to look at the payroll um, of even professors. So, you know, I have colleagues in different departments who came the same year as me different disciplines, different salaries, and so on. So mm -hmm. uh, in no way am I saying that it's it's all equal. But in terms of pressure, I feel it boils down to what the current uh, sort of buzz is sometimes. And mm -hmm. um, if you can make a case for like your subject is important because of this and yeah. it will do, yeah. um, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, what about your your research, which like I think you've you've mentioned it very briefly, but we'll expand on it a bit. Uh, what kind of research do you do, and what areas are you interested in? I am mainly interested in um, the relationship between uh, media, mind, and storytelling. Um, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. all my research projects can be uh, sort of grouped into this, uh, you know, uh, under these three, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. words. Um, so um, to talk about my research, I can backtrack to that period when I was making those decisions about mm -hmm. studying humanities. So as I said, I was this kind of part-time student journalist and uh, I recall that uh, between the time I was in high school and college, uh, a lot of this kind of newspaper supplements that used to come as hard copies when I was in school uh, started migrating to online platforms um, or already had an online component, but were now no longer going to come out in print. It, it was going to be only online. Mm -hmm. So I recall that uh, the moment it became online, my editors would say things like, you know, uh, people's attention spans online is reduced. So we cannot have uh, stories as long as they used to be or, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, and to me, 
I had this thing about questioning these kinds of, you know, wisdom that that is passed around that audiences attention span is lower online. And I was like, okay, I mean, at an intuitive level, it does seem right, but is there research about it that audiences attention span is lower or is it just that there are so many things competing for attention i mean people are uh, you know attending to things but it's like there are more things to attend to like what is the and you know what are those differences so i was intrigued and uh, therefore when i was applying for grad school i recall in the statement of purpose uh, i had written i was interested in studying um, digital aesthetics, I think I called it, like how digital media influence the way we tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, I did not understand or, again, did not have the language to talk about cognition, um, mm -hmm. in, right. which was always in the mix and kind of back up, uh, on the back of my mind. But um, I was like, yeah, how, how digital media influences we tell stories and not just, you know, um, uh, stories in terms of like uh, novels and short stories, but also uh, movies, because mm -hmm. at that time, I remember uh, there were movie directors who were talking a lot about how digital media is uh, either good or bad for cinema and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's where my research trajectory started. And for almost like the first three or four years of grad school, I was still pursuing that relationship between digital media and storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, you know, finding particular kinds of narrative uh, tropes, you can say, or narrative movements that I mm -hmm. felt uh, had to do with the influence of digital media mm -hmm. uh, and uh, attributes of digital media like for mm -hmm. instance you know how hyperlinks um, are a thing in digital mm -hmm. media we click on links all the time mm -hmm. and there were these kinds of experimental books like Mark Danwiski's House of Leaves mm -hmm. which uh, so many scholars before me also have said that it, it tries to bring hyperlinks to books because it has mm -hmm. uh, all these footnotes that distract you and so on mm -hmm. um, so then for a little while, I thought that what I was really getting at is how digital media is reshaping the book as a medium. Mm -hmm. um, and a book, especially in the context of, uh, you know, again, storytelling. Mm -hmm. So not all kinds of books, but a specific kind of book. Mm -hmm. And I continued pursuing that. And actually my dissertation was called Books with Bodies because mm -hmm. uh, one of the, you know, I guess arguments of the dissertation really was that, um, digital media is, uh, you know, books are trying to kind of remediate some of the uh, habits that we, uh, that are commonplace for audiences in digital media, books are trying to kind of remediate and enable those. Uh, but at the same time, books are also trying to um, sort of stress on their own importance by self-reflexively calling attention to the embodied relationship a reader has with mm -hmm. books. Um, this is not to say that our relationship with digital platforms is not embodied. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. touch screens, we touch and all of that, but mm -hmm. uh, a particular kind of embodiment that is, um, uh, that is related to the book. Mm -hmm. um, when I... Uh, then you know uh, joined as assistant professor and kind of continued pursuing research along those lines mm, that's when really i understood that all of these things that i'm saying i'm interested in and working on there is a kind of third component to it which is uh cognition you know memory attention perception and then, you know, I sort of backtracked in my mind that, okay, that is where my interest really came from when people were saying that digital media is doing this to us, doing that to us. And I was really intrigued, like, is it doing these things? Mm -hmm. um, so that's where my research got me. And uh, currently I uh, have worked on, you know, my own monograph, um, my uh, single author book, but I'm also working on, uh, one co-edited book mm -hmm. and another edited book, um, all three of which, again, sort of, um, you know, get at those three ideas, mind, storytelling, and media. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, so when you're talking about this very interesting um, correlation between uh, um, the digital media books and the mind and the attention economies that we're talking about, um, I was I was I was very interested in, in kind of like asking you whether uh, uh, 
how do kind of like social uh, stu like let's take for example your students um how do their social or economic background determine um their kind of relationship to um you know uh, these three aspects you know digital media books and their and the attention economy um um because this is this is because like a lot of us probably have not been trained in reading and that probably we, we need to just acquire it later in our lives or there can be some students who are who are very kind of versatile in their reading and they they're engaged and and uh, the these modalities of the digital are not a problem for them so what do you do you have anything to say do you what, what do you think about that well that's a great question um and you know because i have taught and i'm teaching a very um diverse body of students i know diverse is such a cliched word like it's used for everything today but i think in the cal state system especially the students i teach are um all over the socioeconomic map um i get to teach a lot of first generation college students um of course, a lot of uh, Asian, uh, Latino students, Black mm -hmm. students, and uh, many of them from families or backgrounds that mm -hmm. have not been exposed to this kind of education. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there are many different aspects to this question. One is, of course, when I'm teaching a particular kind of course, when there are these modalities or these very highly experimental books, mm -hmm. how they respond to it. Um, I think to the things that I teach in specific and within the context of the course, they are fascinated by it because they did not know something like this existed and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of my students in terms of their comfort level with digital modalities um, are very comfortable with, you know, the haptics um, mm -hmm. um, because they have been exposed to uh, smartphones, even if they did not have very uh, highly technologically advanced laptops, maybe they, everyone, like I think every student in my class has access to smartphones at mm -hmm. least. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, through that are exposed to the haptics. Now, this is not to say that just because they're comfortable with the haptics, they're all equally comfortable or so on, but um, they think about it. Also, if they're not on social media, for instance, they know other people who are on it. And so they come with some preconceived ideas about it and so on. Um, but there are lots of inequities for sure. Um, and these inequities uh, are addressed sometimes in the kinds of stories uh, I teach mm -hmm. um, because I typically try to choose books uh, or stories that are uh, not oblivious to the socioeconomic realities of the world, uh, mm -hmm. right? So in that sense, um, students can connect or feel seen by those stories, or that mm -hmm. is what I at least try to do. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the other aspect to the question uh, is that, uh, you know, th the fact that there is a lot of exposure uh, to digital media on university campuses here, various like people from all sorts of backgrounds may not have had that exposure within their families or there are international students too. And I know that even though I've been to uh, some prominent colleges in India, uh, they would have this one computer lab uh, of sorts, at least when I was studying. And um, I did not have my own laptop until much later mm -hmm. and maybe not before I came for grad school. So, you know, my own access to digital mm -hmm. media was limited even when I was thinking so much about digital media mind mm -hmm. and so on. Um, I guess that gets reflected in one problem I have faced with the corpus, um, I, corpus of narratives or stories I use for my research, which is that um, I was interested in this question of digital media mind storytelling, but I would not often find uh, books for a very long time, uh, books or stories by, uh, by authors from say India or you know uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, etc., uh, who are addressing these questions. So you know, even though I did not quite in, initially, at least, want my uh, dissertation to be about um, 
US and UK authors, it kind of accidentally became that way. Because I think authors in Europe or North America had access to a lot of digital platforms for their creative projects or, you know, just when they were going to school, college or whatever, uh, before a lot of us did in South Asia. And so uh, back when in 2011 or 2012, I started doing uh, my grad school in the US, the books that were out there um, that were doing these kinds of experimental works were, mm -hmm. were inevitably coming out of North America or Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that was a sort of setback for me for a little while where mm -hmm. I was like, okay, so if I'm interested in studying say South Asian authors, I have to have completely different research questions because mm -hmm. um, they are not doing the work that I'm doing, but mm -hmm. I was interested in the poetics and so on. So I kind of stuck to my original ideas, which mm -hmm. meant um, working on a corpus that was not, uh, that, that was not something that I chose, but had to because of my research questions. Mm -hmm. How how is your own experience as a writer? I think you you write you write stories as well and you write poetry. Uh, how is your experience as a writer has been shaped by all these digital modalities, and also the kind of um, uh, probably the constraints imposed by that, especially. Um, in that case, you know, attention economy can be a constraint because they would ask you to have this amount of words and this amount of words and this amount of lines, whatever. So how has that shaped your trajectory as a writer? When it comes to poetry, because poetry, um, at least the kind that I have always written are sort of, uh, you know, were already kind of on the shorter side, I guess. Um, any kind of word length related questions I have faced is always about either nonfiction essays, sometimes about uh, short stories, but mostly nonfiction essays that I'm writing for any kind of digital platform that, you know, explore 15 ideas, but with mm. a thousand words kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, on one hand, uh, you know, uh, I wonder, uh, or actually now having done some research uh, about that, um, I, from the existing research, I know that uh, digital media or our attention and minds work slightly differently when we are um, exposed to a screen, which also has other tabs on it open, mm -hmm. something is blinking because somebody is messaging us and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is not as straightforward or simple as the moment we open a computer, our attention like miraculously uh, decreases. Um, there is also something to be said about having to scroll to read versus having to flip a page to read. Mm -hmm. um, and there is that difference too. Uh, so um, in terms of my own writing, um, my first experimental novella, I call it novella because it's really short. Uh, I think it's a little over like 40,000 words. Um, it was called Open Couplets, which was published by Yoda Press, <laughs> sorry, um, which was published by Yoda Press in 2017. That uh, sort of addresses, um, uh, that tries to be the kind of fiction that I wish had existed mm -hmm. um, because it, uh, uh, I wish it had existed because it addresses digital media a particular way. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, told in the form of emails along mm -hmm. with uh, sort of ethnographic work being done by one of the main characters of the story. Mm -hmm. So the storytelling is extremely fragmented. There are also sort of chat uh, transcripts uh, inserted in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even when there are emails, it is not as if one character is writing email to another character and throughout we have two characters, uh, you know, carrying out the conversation. But within the span of 40, 45,000 words, it is um, quite a few characters writing emails to one another. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them from the past, some of them in the present. And the way the chapters are organized is that the protagonist, she is typing a particular word in her uh, inbox to sort where those words existed in her previous emails mm -hmm. and those emails come up. Mm -hmm. um, so 
that is how that uh, novella is built. Uh, it is also experimental and kind of in line with the kinds of fiction I was reading at the time. Mm -hmm. I was um, writing my, or uh, yeah, I was writing my dissertation when I was writing that novel as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in a way that novel reflects a lot of the thinking I was doing around digital media and storytelling uh, while writing my dissertation. Now, um, the more recent fiction I have written, the relationship of digital media with those is much more subtle, I would say. Like, mm -hmm. um, I have written this story called Good Deity, which was uh, published earlier this year by Necessary Fiction, mm -hmm. in which I think about um, rural India, rural Bengal in specific, mm -hmm. and um, Memification or the culture of kind of circulating memes, creation mm -hmm. and circulation of memes. Um, and, uh, you know, WhatsApp forwards essentially, because mm -hmm. um, I don't know how, if you face that in your family and friend circles, but it is quite amazing to me that um, my family and acquaintances in India they are it seems like their life revolves around a flood of whatsapp forwards mm -hmm. constantly like it starts off with you know somebody saying good morning with a random a picture of a flower <laughs> uh, then um you know uh, then you know whether it's an election um that's coming up and random stories about the ministers or whoever is standing for that election um and of course no verification whatsoever about whether those stories are true or false. So I was really intrigued about, you know, why mm. is it that, you know, WhatsApp, people use WhatsApp here in the US as well. And, you know, fake news is a thing here too, mm. but why the specific modality of WhatsApp and mm. the way it, uh, the way people use it in India, at least mm. the way, you know, what I have seen, um, because I also recall that when I went to India back in uh, 2018, 2019, and I went to watch a movie in the theater, and one of the advertisements, you know, uh, in the interval of the film was WhatsApp basically saying, like, uh, the company uh, advertising and saying, like, please don't spread fake news on <laughs> WhatsApp. <laughs> so I've ironic. never seen an ad like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, so uh, that is addressed by the story. But um, uh, why I said it's subtle, it's because on the surface of it, that's the structure of the story seems like, you know, social realism, but mm -hmm. it is social realism where the social includes the mm -hmm. technological and the technopolitical because there is a political side to it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your book, which is going to be out very soon, uh, like in October. Um, I think you you may have repeated a lot that is you know that you're going to say about your book, but I think uh, uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to how it's going to turn out. So let's let's just uh, uh, talk to our viewers and guests about your about your book, your monograph. Yes, yeah, so uh, the book Helena is referring to was called Out of Mind. Uh, mode, mediation, and cognition in 21st century narrative. It is going to be out in October from the Ohio State University Press. Um, I'm really excited about the book because um, in a way it feels like the culmination of the work that I have been doing for uh, right from the beginning of grad school. Mm. Um, the main question that the book addresses, and I think this is maybe the first sentence in the book itself, it's how do we think about thinking? Um, so okay. the, that is kind of the guiding question about mm -hmm. in the book. Um, mm -hmm. How do we talk about thought uh, across disciplines? Mm -hmm. And how does this, what we think about thinking or the ways we think about thinking, um, how does media, influence that mm -hmm. and uh, it and particularly why I'm interested in media is because if you look at the discourse around thought not just in the 21st century but you know even if we go uh, back in time um, often uh, a lot of media or especially new media mm -hmm. is used by philosophers and sometimes scientists to talk about thought because you cannot talk about thought without talking about it in a metaphorical language. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So there is a kind of metaphorical aspect to any kind of discourse around mm. consciousness and media uh, turns out to be one of the oft chosen uh, metaphors for it. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, in the 1940s onward, I guess like um, some Alan Turing's, uh, some pivotal paper onwards, mm -hmm. there was a period when thought and thinking was uh, talked of in terms of computers and computation, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, there was this very popular understanding that the mind is a digital computer. Mm -hmm. Of course, cognitive science then, you know, um, sort of questioned that premise and uh, there have been lots of other um, interventions and so on, uh, mm -hmm. but the computer metaphor uh, comes up every now and then. Um, it has entered the contemporary culture and colloquially people will refer to it without always knowing where it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, so computer is one of many kind of media technological uh, things, objects around us that uh, is used to talk about thought or how the mind works. Mm -hmm. um, so my book essentially kind of takes up these uh, particular metaphors, uh, media metaphors or mm -hmm. Uh, mediation metaphors that exist around consciousness, especially in 21st century, um, through the particular stories that are told. And um, the stories are, you know, stylized fictions. Um, so I'm not talking about conversational stories always mm -hmm. in the book, but um, yeah, so I, one uh, section of the book is about computers, computation, what I just mentioned here. Then there is a section which is about map cartography and uh, also particularly, you know, um, the changes brought to cartography through digital technology and how uh, contemporary stories think about it. Uh, in that chapter, I talk a little bit um, about a particular section from Kamila Shamsi's novel, um, Cartography, mm -hmm. where uh, she, uh, actually one of the main characters in the book, mm -hmm. um, he, as a kid, started drawing maps and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maps are a very important part of the book. I mean, the book is called Cartography, yeah. but um, toward the end of the book, uh, Kareem um, basically dreams up this idea of a digital cartographic project mm -hmm. where he is going to create a, a dynamic map of Karachi and um, is going to kind of geolocate stories. The stories mm -hmm. will be in different languages, so on and so forth. Of mm -hmm. course, in the book, he, he's just kind of narrating it in dialogue mm -hmm. uh, with Rahin, uh, who is uh, the main narrator in the book. But um, the fact that a cartography Shams's book came out, I think, in 2002, the fact that, you know, she is uh, including this as part of her fiction was very intriguing to me, you know, the, the kind of possibilities of digital media she is thinking of at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, maps are um, another chapter. Then I think about pictures because they are another kind of oft used metaphors, mm -hmm. but um, I particularly think about selfies uh, or you know okay. self representation pictures mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, how they are used in discourses about the mind and mm -hmm. you know the mm -hmm. reflection of that in fiction and uh, another uh, uh, it's the last chapter in the book is around uh, memory discourses and mm -hmm. um, how archive as a term features in those discourses um, and mm -hmm. so on so so that's kind of the scope of the book. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, and, you know, during your this long trajectory, I think I have, I think, sorry, I think you have a lot to offer for, for anyone who's, who's, you know, who are now humanities students or who are wishing to do the humanities in future despite, um, you know, um, other, other uh, the crisis situations that we're facing. How would you want to um, talk to them? Uh, you know, those, those students who are doing the doing humanities right now, or those who wish to do it, what kind of what kind of um, advice or what kind of uh, thing would you want, would you like to tell them? Um, so advice feels you know, <laughs> advice is like too difficult. But I guess what I want to say is um, when we join the humanities, um, at least if we are joining humanities or doing humanities at 
uh, you know, um, grad studies level. One of the things uh, that I did not get exposed to in India, as well as in the US, is what you can do with humanities beyond, you know, being a professor. <laughs> yeah. I know it's kind of ironic I'm talking about it because I am a professor, but um, but it, you know, sometimes when you're in grad school, it feels like that's kind of the only thing, the trajectory. Mm. And if you're going to talk about crisis at humanities, that's where the crisis really is. It's a mm. job market crisis, mm -hmm. budgetary crisis. Um, but there are lots of other alternate and I guess even more exciting than professorship careers out there uh, and things that you can do with the humanities. Um, so uh, because I, am, um, I live in Northern California, for instance, sometimes I meet a lot of people who are working um, on tech, but what they're really interested in is that philosophy um, of, you know, how minds work and their kind of, uh, you know, what kind of stories need to be told or what kind of stories are being told and even trying to address uh, questions of equity and, uh, you know, um, uh, trying to bring conscience to uh, particular aspects of tech. And in those projects, I do not always see a lot of humanity scholars uh, participating in them because there are these, uh, you know, uh, divides between humanities and sciences. And so often the people doing the thinking are not people who have been trained to, to do that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess there is a lot of room for humanity scholars to intervene in the cultures around us um, beyond the, you know, the academic mm -hmm. setup or uh, beyond becoming a professor and that kind of thing. So um, I guess uh, this is not just advice for like grad students that mm -hmm. think about the other options. Even as a professor now, I try to think about how I may talk to my students about these opportunities. Um, so I, I try to, in my own way, uh, talk to my students about this, but I feel like there is some responsibility um, on, you know, other professors, colleagues mm -hmm. uh, I have, um, and in departments at large. So it's not just an individual kind of one-on-one, -on -one, but departments um, mm -hmm. exposing students to what humanity is, what the knowledge um, that they are gaining, what the kind of thinking they're doing in the classroom setting, what that can do in the world at large. That's wonderful. Um, we congratulate you for your upcoming book and all the projects that you are involved in um, and um, wishing you all the best for everything that you hope to do in future. Thank you so much, Dr. Tosa Kosha, for being with us today. It's a real pleasure and an, and an honor to have you. Do you have any final words before we wrap up? Well, thank you for doing this podcast and uh, for having me. And I think what you are doing and what a lot of other podcasters are doing who uh, come from humanities backgrounds is also a good example of how humanities can intervene in more popular and general public discourses around us. Mm -hmm. So that is really important work. And I think um, it is one of the things that should inspire other people doing humanities. So uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tosa Goshal. Um, it's, it's such a wonderful um, conversation that we had and I hope um, we continue to have these conversations and to have you uh, on another episode, uh, perhaps um, later when, when our podcast grows and you know, we have, we have um, a lot of room for other discussions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.